how's everyone doing out there? I'm sorry. I'm slightly congested today, but this is Jeff Black. <laughs> we have Brandon Day Cruz. We are Chasing Clarity Health and Fitness Podcast. We're bringing to you episode 73, Myths Around Fat Loss, Metabolism, Weight Regain, and Dieting That Needs to Die. Wow, that was a very intense title, Brandon. Deconstructing Common Fitness Fallacies is basically what we are going to do today. Um, that being said, B, let's get a little quick, like how your last seven days have been, and then we'll get into this so we can kind of make sure we get all eight of these things in. Absolutely, my man. So my last seven days have been going great as uh, we were catching up off air, but uh, I've just been trying to enjoy the last little bit of summer, especially because, you know, I'm in the Northeast, so pretty soon, a couple of weeks from now, weather will be uh, depreciating essentially, but uh, I'm doing what I can to enjoy it, but I'm also preparing myself for what will what I anticipate to be a very busy fall uh, season. And I do want to say, you know, before we get into all of this, I do want to say and highlight on something that I'm really pleased with the reception we received on last week's episode on the topic of weight loss resistance. And I had many listeners as well as felt or like fitness professionals and coaches reach out to say how much they enjoyed the episode and our breakdown of the actual research around metabolic adaptation and weight loss resistance. And it's always really great to receive that type of feedback from our audience, as well as even from our own clients, because I know that both of our clients listen to the show, if they share it, and they're really involved within the community that we have from Chasing Clarity. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I really think about it, when I first came to you with the idea of this podcast, it was to bridge the gap between research and information and practical application. And when we were brainstorming what to call the show, we specifically decided on the name of Chasing Clarity as we wanted to get across the fact that our show was going to cut through the bullshit. We we're going to cut through the misinformation, the disinformation spread in the fitness industry and through social media, especially. We were going to provide clarity on complex topics. And also personally, I thought it was about time that a group of individuals or someone in this industry provided both a evidence as well as an experience-based perspective that nailed the coffin in many misunderstood topics and once and for all killed, you know, what I like to refer to as sacred cows and uh, these self-limiting beliefs that aren't doing people good by believing in them. So with every episode, I really feel like we move further closer to our goal. We reach more people. We have a positive impact on those that listen to us as well as, you know, I have a lot of listeners that tell me, Hey, I shared this with my client. You know, I shared this with my client group, or I shared this with my mom, or I shared this with my sister. Like, that's having the ripple yeah. effect of coaching. That's really like, we see that in our own day-to-day -day lives in terms of how, when we improve, when you improve anything in your life, everything improves. So if you improve your fitness, you improve your health, you improve your relationships. All these things can be multifactorial. And I find that even with my own clients. So for instance, I'm going to give a shout out to one of my, um, my longtime clients, Catherine, and she's out in New Zealand. And a lot of times our conversations, like essentially her body transformation as well as her, you know, uh, mindset transformation has really rubbed off into her husband. Like I know all about her husband now. So shout out to Neil, because I know he listens to this as well. And he's not a client of mine, but he's transformed his life as a whole. And now they are great role models for their children. And so that is just a really fulfilling feeling. And ultimately, really what we're trying to do is provide education and providing education creates understanding. And what we have to realize about that is understanding creates trust. Trust yields buy-in which leads to greater effort and adherence. And then through that better adherence and consistency, we get better results. So I'm glad that we're able to show up on a weekly basis, really provide people with education, with empowerment, uh, week in and week out, and really have a positive impact on this industry. Because ultimately, like what I want to do, and I know that you're you're really aligned on this mission. I, since day one that I entered this industry, I've wanted to leave it better than I found it. And I think that if I look back 10 years ago when I got into this, and you could probably speak the same of 20 years ago when you got into this, uh, little by little, we're having more and more of an effect in a positive regard. I agree with you 100%. I just like to tell everyone, I am so glad that you had that conversation with me about your about opening up your mind to training gym pop because you're way more excited. No offense, Anthony, but he is way more excited about <laughs> the gym pop people than training your lazy ass. But anyway, uh, <laughs> he'll be like, fuck you. Dude, he's lifestyle now. I'll tell you, we did a, a lifestyle lean, which is still fucking shredded. But uh, shout out to Anthony. We just finished his fat loss phase on Sunday. He looks fucking peeled. So anyone can check him out on the grant. But uh, I've been able to, because I've taken that more lifestyle approach in terms of transitioning out of bodybuilding myself to really go all in on coaching, but also training more and more and more lifestyle clients. I've been able to even help others transition from competing, even on the pro level, 
Two, deciding that, you know, and they made their own decisions on their own. Hey, listen, I don't want to compete competitively anymore, or I want to take off time from the stage. And I really want to be able to live life as well as improve my physique throughout, throughout the process. But not only, you know, rely on what the, the, the judges tell me I have to look like. And it's really been, you've inspired me to do that. And I, I'm appreciative for it. And I'm really glad to be able to have an impact beyond just competitors. Ah, uh, yeah, man. I'm, I, I noticed that I only trained a few bodybuilders and they're the ones I really like. Otherwise I'm like, oh, it's hard because you're only as good as the last title you win them or get them. And I just, I have those conversations all the time. I'm like, not everyone's fucking Phil Heath. Not everyone can do 400 tasks, 400 EQ and just walk out, win Mr. USA in like two years. But that's the conversation. Well, let's not say not everyone. everyone. At 99.9% .9 of people cannot exactly. do that. There is only exactly. one Phil Heath, and there will only be one Phil Heath, one, you know, Ronnie Coleman. And yes, success leaves clues, but we cannot always, you know, a lot of these guys are great in spite of what they do, not because of what they do. Agreed. Um, my last day is seven days have been really good. Business has been superb. I've had a stellar, stellar summer. Um, I actually am stopping going in Thursday afternoons into the gym opening up a little bit earlier in the morning um so that way i have a whole day to do check-ins because i would like literally leave leave come back and have to do check-ins at night which just wires me going into work on friday so um <clears throat> i've got some good stuff going on with the gym uh the book is pretty cool i think i got a cover i've just got to change a picture or two done for it and then i gotta find someone if anyone out there in the social media land is good about wants to write a bio about me and maybe help me with that. Let me know. I'm not good about writing about myself. I'm, I am unlike most arrogant fucking coaches in the space and can't think of two sentences about myself. This positive only I'm like depressed cloud of sadness that walks around pretending he's a happy panda when really he's sad, you know, like it'd be a terrible thing, but uh, I just, but anyway, if anyone out there really does write bios, hit me up. Um, Let's see, Keegan met with Cameron Cheek, his coach, two weeks ago. Um, yeah, dude, he's starting to, like, change his eating habits. He dropped all his chips and asked for fruit. Um, just good stuff like that. I'm excited to see him kind of embrace it and want to want to terrorize. Uh, he's apparently the most popular kid in the seventh grade, I found out, because he's in weightlifting class. So Ninja's in there benching more than the football players. Because, you know, like seventh grade, you know, at that time, but Keegan's eyes saw this experience. So he's in there like curling 15, 20 pound dumbbells, pressing the 30, 35s. He's just do, do, do. And I'm like, yeah, good for you, buddy. You eat like 3,000 calories a day. I hope you're doing great. Dear and, Lord. Dude, he eats like about as much as I, me. Dude, I've seen him eat. I've seen oh, him prepare wow. his meals as well. Yeah. I, uh, he's got great habits. And uh, that's a great foundation, especially to start yeah. with. Because think about when we were that age, we did not have that type of foundation, nor did I'll, I'll speak from my own personal experience. I had a father that was extremely ill, terminally ill. And so I actually became the way I am in spite of what I saw. And so, you know, generally when we see with parenting, we see either someone has a really good experience and they become more like that parent, or they have mm. a really bad experience and they either become more like that because they're traumatized or they go in the exact opposite direction. So, you know, I'm eight years old. I see my father have a heart attack and I'm like, dude, health is super important. Then I saw him yeah. struggle with diabetes and all these, you know, um, essentially lifestyle based diseases based off of poor nutrition, poor lifestyle habits, smoking, things of that sort. And so I went in the complete opposite direction. You know, I haven't drank since I was 20 years old. Um, yeah, you know, I've never smoked, none of that kind of stuff. And so uh, it really had a positive impact in my life in terms of me rectifying some of the mistakes I see, saw others make, including my father. But uh, with you, you've given a great example for your son in terms of what he should or what he may want to aspire to be. And right now he's falling in your footsteps. And I know it's really not by you pushing like, yes, you want to have a positive impact on him, but it's not like you're like, listen, you have to do bodybuilding. Like, no, that's a passion that you guys both mutually uh, share. And it's something that I'm sure it's going to be a bonding experience for, for the next few decades, to say the least. A hundred percent. Well, let's get into this thing today, man. Um, I think it'll be a really good one. So we decided to kind of deconstruct common fitness fallacies, the lies, the stuff that we see that bothers us. Like I personally just cringe whenever I see the current hypertrophy movement where someone explains things for 18 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, 95% of the people don't give a shit, but okay. Um, we would kind of thought we'd get into this. Uh, dieting for fat loss is all physical, is myth one. Ooh. 
I'll let you take that one. Oh, All right, my man. All right, so some of the stuff I, I'm gonna laugh. I just know it. <laughs> like, I just well, well that's the thing. So, it. so we got it. We got to break these things down and really deconstruct them because a lot of people hear these things and and believe them. And so we're here to, you know, really spread education and really yeah. uh, make sure that we're, you know, giving the audience a more all encompassing viewpoint that's more correct, more evidence based, and things of that sort. So, I always say that we cannot separate our psychology from our physiology. And this is especially true when it comes to the goal of losing body fat and entering a diet, as fat loss isn't just a physical process, it's a mental process as well. And in our industry, many only touch on the physical and physiological aspects of dieting, such as the needs to maintain a calorie deficit and the necessity of resistance training during a diet to preserve lean muscle mass, which are both essential parts and principles of dieting for fat loss. Yet, the mental side of dieting is one of the most commonly overlooked components of both nutrition and lifestyle change processes. And so, in order to truly succeed in a fat loss phase and to be able to get lean and stay lean, you need to focus on your mindset, not only prior to entering a diet, but also throughout the dieting phase itself, as your mindset can either help or hinder the process and the results you achieve. And if you're not in the right state of mind or not in the right mental state when approaching a diet, it not only makes, um, you know, or essentially when you are in the right state of mind, essentially, when entering a diet, it not only makes the process a lot easier and more fulfilling, but it also increases your likelihood to succeed during the diet and once the diet is over. So you're going to be better able and more likely to maintain the results once you finish that dieting phase. However, if you're not in a good place psychologically and your relationship with food is poor or it's skewed, prior to starting a fat loss diet, you're setting yourself up to encounter even more issues mentally, which will bleed over physically and cause your body to be less responsive to the reductions in food you're trying to make and the fat loss you're trying to elicit. And this is why I believe it's really important to analyze whether or not someone is truly ready to diet before going into a fat loss phase in and of itself. And we have to think about this both from a physical and a mental perspective. And in order to do this, I like to peel back the layers of the onion with my clients and look a bit deeper to see if there are any red flags that stick out prior to dieting them down. However, regardless if you're working with a coach or you're about to enter a deficit by yourself, you should be asking the following questions prior to beginning your fat loss journey. You want to ask yourself, what is your reason for wanting to diet? What is your dieting history like and your experience with diet? When was the last time you dieted? Did you just get out of diet and you're trying to go right back into it? Or has it been quite some time where you've restored yourself and given your body some recovery and some replenishment and some good fueling uh, between those phases? What is your current relationship with food like? What is your body image like? Are you tied to a physical goal and outcome? Or are you ready to embrace the process and focus on being process oriented? And also, are you willing to change your habits and modify your behaviors in order to more effectively and efficiently reach your goal? And these are all aspects you should be taking into consideration before committing yourself to the process of transforming your physique. Because if your mind isn't in the right place, your body will not follow you and it won't respond the way you want it to. So then you're going to be stuck in the situation where you're trying to force fat loss. And also, if your head is not in the right place before going into a fat loss phase or during it, this can be an anchor or a bottleneck that prevents you from reaching your maximum potential. Because if we think about it, like in all fitness related endeavors, our mindset around the process can either help or hinder our efforts, our results, and our progress. And this is important to hit on because fat loss seems simple on paper, but it's complex in the real world, which is why so many people report that they failed their previous weight loss diets and fat loss attempts. But if we really look at why many quote unquote fail during fat loss phases, besides not adhering to the diet or not, you know, consistently maintaining a deficit, a lot of the reasons why many say that they haven't achieved the lean physique they desire have to do with their mentality and their mindset during the diet. And some of the mental roadblocks that many that hold many back from reaching their physique goals, including always wanting to wait until the right time to start. Like this is my, you know, I hear people say this all the time. It's not the right time. It's not the right time. Now, here's the thing. There will never be a perfect time to chase our goals. As life is unpredictable, we can't, you know, um, see, you know, we can't forecast the future. So you need to stop constantly waiting for the right time as there may never be a right time. So if you continue waiting for life to present you with this opportunity to get lean, you'll never start the process and you'll stay stuck exactly where you are. And achieving your physique goals isn't about having the ambition to do so. It's about taking action in the present moment and working towards making progress over time. Another mental hurdle that holds many back is being scared of change and fearful of stepping outside of their comfort zone, which results in people just continuing to do the same things over and over again. And we see this all the time. Like someone gets stuck with this diet ideology because either they feel a part of a community or, you know, it's this 
you know, diet tribalism, essentially, and they're doing something that doesn't work for them. However, if what you've been doing with your diet and training has yet to yield the results you can, you desire, continuing to do them is only going to continue giving you the same subpar results and outcomes you're unhappy with. So you need to be willing to make changes to see the changes you want, or else you're going to stay stuck forever as a result of always doing what you've done and thus continuing to not see the body composition progress and, and especially the health progress that you've been aiming for. And another reason why many fail is because they quit too early. And I find that most individuals have one of two perspectives on losing fat. They either have limited experience with dieting, so they think the process should be easy, which is an assumption no one should make. Or they're on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, and they have tried to attempt to diet unsuccessfully so many times in the past that they fear failing again and again and believe losing fat and getting lean is impossible for them. And in either scenario, what often happens is as soon as things get tough and the process of dieting gets challenging or they experience a stall or plateau, they quit because they think that they won't be able to get past it. But all this results in is a cycle of diet attempts to diet failures because many aren't willing to embrace the challenges that come along with the process and to work towards navigating around them and overcoming them, which is if they did, they'd see how truly capable they are. But because they quit too early, they never had this realization and never see how truly capable they are of transforming their physique. And another mental hurdle I find many, you know, I find hinders many during a fat loss phase is having a fixed mindset where they think they need to be perfect rather than realizing you don't need to aim to be perfect. You just need to focus on progression and on getting better and more consistent with your diet, your training, and your activity levels over time. And I'll tell you personally, like, I work with a ton of type A and, you know, you know, type A individuals and they're ambitious and I love that about them. And I can relate to them as this is my exact personality type, but our main drawback is that we're perfectionists, which is something I myself had to do a lot of internal work and, and go to counseling for it, honestly, to overcome as it can be a double-edged sword that can help us in certain circumstances, but can also hinder us in many other situations, including when we're dieting. And many take this approach where they're all, either all in or they're all out. They either give hundred percent or they don't try at all. And they're either doing things perfectly yet when they can't, they just say, screw it and call it a day. And many who are type A get frustrated when they encounter a situation that's out of their control, which is why it's important to remember that you need to focus on what's within your control. So if someone comes, you know, something comes up that's out of your control and causes you to have to say, swap out a few food sources or miss a meal or, you know, change out a meal or miss a workout. Don't worry about it because you're always just one meal or one workout away from being on track, which is something I think many would benefit from realizing because a lot of individuals let one deviation from their plan compound and turn into a whole day, a whole weekend or a whole week off plan. But that's the same mentality that causes them to stall and plateau. And it's really equivalent to like, say you got a flat tire, Jeff. You're on a road trip, you got a flat tire, and then instead of just simply replacing it and getting back on the road, you slash all three of your other remaining tires okay. and never get to your destination. That's essentially what you're doing when you say, hey, I, I slipped up on a meal. Now I'm going to just say screw it for the rest of the day. So ultimately, when it comes to your mindset during a fat loss phase, you need to realize that we're not aiming for perfection. We're aiming for progression. So don't ruminate on what went wrong in the past. Instead, focus on what things you can do right to make progress moving forward. I agree with that 100%. So this one right here is experiencing hunger during a diet is a bad thing. And that is something I explained to even Keegan, who is my return 13 in December. I said, look, man, when you do go down this road of bodybuilding, you'll never look at yourself the same. You'll never look at others the same. You'll never look at food the same. You're going to look at things a lot differently, but you're also going to have experiences of extreme fullness when you're in the season of having to push. There's going to be times you're going to be hungry and you have to learn that you are still eating enough food. It's just trying to accomplish a goal of what you have. And I think, you know, I've been doing this for 18 years. I know you're right there at like 15, 13, whatever the number is. But I think we could say over the time we've been doing this, we've seen people want to be like, well, what's the more comfortable way? What's the easier way? What? And I'm like, what the fuck is intuitive eating? Like, I heard that. I'm like, huh? And there'll always be someone who's like tried every diet fad. And I'm like, well, you don't do the hard work. And that's the part that really bothers me because to me, when you go through a deficit, the hunger is the hard work. It's not the actual like diet, the act of dieting and the training. It's, it's managing not the training the hunger. All. Yeah, it's the hunger. So I guess let's just be, we're both shaking our head like this is a, a silly one, but I personally think hunger is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, there gets to points where you're just ravenous and so forth and it's miserable. But if you're working with someone, that's what diet breaks are for, deloads and different things that science has shown. Maybe it has some value. But what's your views on this, man? Do you think that hunger during a diet is a bad thing? 
Yeah. So before I get into this, I, I do want to hit on something that you mentioned because, you know, the interesting thing about our industry as a whole, so we're talking nutrition, fitness, training, is that it swung so much in the opposite direction of where it was or where we were, say, 10 to 15 years ago. And what was completely a normal part of dieting when yeah. we first got into this is now taboo. So for example, when we first got into nutrition, we were told we needed to eat clean to get lean. But nowadays people will promote to you that you literally can eat anything, including a Big Mac a day from McDonald's and you'll lose body fat. We were told that cardio kills gains, but nowadays we have research showing that cardio and improving our aerobic fitness can actually improve our ability to build muscle due to its positive impact on our fitness levels and recovery capacity. And we embrace the fact that you would need to make sacrifices to get lean. But nowadays, everyone wants to make it seem like if you have to push yourself or you have to sacrifice anything at all during a fat loss phase or prep, whether that be hyperpalatable calorie dense foods or alcohol for a temporary period of time that you're taking, you're not taking a balance, you know, quote unquote balanced approach. And we knew that experiencing hunger during a diet was a good thing as it was a sign that we were losing body fat and yeah. making progress. But nowadays, many make it seem like you should never experience hunger and that hunger during a diet is a bad thing, which literally makes no sense from a physiological perspective and just show, shows how soft our industry has gotten where many will promote ideas to make it seem like we should all be able to reach our physique goals easily. And the process should be a walk in the park, which is why so many fail to actually reach their goals as they've been sold this simple story that everything should come easily and quickly as though our physique goals should be as convenient and instant to attain as an order from Amazon Prime or from you know ordering something from Uber Eats. And here's the thing. Hunger is generally one of the most common feelings dieters who are actually maintaining a calorie deficit will experience during a fat loss phase. And our hunger and our appetite levels will inc increase the longer we diet and the leaner we get. So what many will notice during a diet is there's actually quite a bit of difference between the amount of food we may want to eat and the amount of food that we'll actually need to eat to effectively and efficiently lose fat, continue getting leaner, and hit our physique goal. And hunger is a natural response to a calorie deficit, aka energy restriction, which is an inherent part of the fat loss process, which we should expect. So as you lose more and more body fat, the more of an increase in hunger you'll notice, and the more of an increase in appetite you'll experience. And this is because as we get deeper into a fat loss phase and we get leaner and we continue to drop body fat, there are a few physiological changes that take place that amplify our hunger and our appetite levels, such the fact that our leptin levels decrease so in turn our satiety levels lower you know our levels of ghrelin increase so our hunger levels increase and then because of this change in our satiety and our hunger hormones our appetite levels and our food focus increases and this is a completely natural and evolutionary response to being in a calorie deficit and it's actually a sign that you're in a deficit you're losing body fat and you're depleting some of your body's your body's fat stores. So this isn't something that should be looked at as a bad thing at all, because if you're not experiencing hunger at some point in a diet, you're most likely not going to be losing any significant amount of body fat. And so we have to do away with this whole thing. Like everything should be comfortable. Everything should be easy. If that was the case, we'd all be walking around, you know, fucking shred. But that that's not the case. 70 to 75 percent of people in our population in America today, today are overweight or obese. So if it was that easy, unfortunately, you know, we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic. And also, you know, it just isn't the case. And we have to be realistic and, and transparent about that. We should expect hunger and it should be something that we stop trying to, you know, there's always ways to mitigate it, to manage it, but ultimately you're going to experience some hunger. And that's something you have to be okay with and acknowledge right off the bat before going into a dieting phase. Um, I want to just reiterate, if you're hungry and you feel like you look better and you know, you feel better and the scale's going down, then you're probably doing good shit. The end. Da, 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 da. Having a low metabolic rate, aka that dreaded slow metabolism <laughs> that limits your ability to lose fat. Yeah, I've only seen that in people who intentionally starve themselves for so long that you generally have to work it back up. And even then they respond pretty quickly once they kind of get their micronutrients and things like that under, under wing. But Brandon, what's your thoughts and what does research say on that? All right. So one of the main myths that is out there is what I refer to as the RMR myth. So the resting metabolic rate myth. And this is the concept that your metabolic rate is highly predictive of your ability to successfully lose body fat and lose weight during a diet. So if you are to be someone that has a low metabolic rate at the start of a diet, it'll decrease your likelihood of, un of successfully losing weight as compared to someone who has a high metabolic rate. Now, at first glance or the first time you hear this, it does sound logical. 
which is why many believe it. However, in research, we do not see that those with a low metabolic rate lose less fat during a diet than those with a high metabolic rate, nor do we see that those with the highest baseline metabolic rates at the start or end of diets end up leaner than those with lower metabolic rates, which is something that we covered in depth and in detail in episode 69 of the show on adaptive metabolisms and metabolic phenotypes. And in a 2017 study published in the Journal of Clinical Obesity, they looked at the associations between resting metabolic rate and weight loss to see if having a low metabolic rate, aka a slow metabolism, impacted weight loss in a negative manner. And this study looked at close to 400 adults in a weight management clinic, and they looked at two things. First, they looked at the relationship between one's baseline resting metabolic rate and weight loss. And the second thing they did was they looked at the associations between the change in one's resting metabolic rate from dieting and weight loss. And both the men and women in the study lost a significant amount of weight with the men averaging around six kilograms and the females averaging 5.6 kilograms of weight loss. So both sexes successfully lost weight. And then when looking at the two primary focuses of the study, they saw that there was no relationship between an individual's baseline RMR and their weight loss outcomes for both the men and women, meaning if someone had a low metabolic rate at the start of the study, it did not slow the rate of weight loss. In terms of the associated change between RMR and weight loss, the larger drops in a dieter's resting metabolic rate were actually associated with greater weight loss outcomes, which shows that having a lower metabolic rate isn't preventing you from losing weight, but more so that the more weight you lose, so the more successful you are in a diet, the higher the likelihood that your RMR will drop which is actually a sign of successful weight loss. So ultimately, this study shows that your metabolism, even if it's slow, is not going to halt your ability to lose weight. And this is why I'm such a big proponent of focusing on factors within our control outside of the resting metabolic rate, because really that besides gaining muscle mass, we're not going to really be able to tangibly control that. So really, we should be focusing on things such as maintaining a quality and nutrient dense diet consistently training hard to build and or maintain muscle and incorporating some type of movement practice into our daily lives, especially when the goal is losing fat and maintaining a lean, healthy physique, rather than getting fixated on whether we have a slow or a fast metabolism, because this is something that held so many people back that they think in their mind, they have a slow metabolic rate because they've gained weight over the years, which is the next thing we're going to cover. But it's something that really uh, holds them back from really going after the goals and going all in on the process of fat loss and of dieting. Yeah, let's get into that damn point because I think that's a good one. Having a low bulk metabolic rate increases your chance of gaining weight in the future. Well, I mean, when you start eating food, you're going to actually like gain weight. It's kind of normal. So most people think they're immediately going to gain fat. I'm like, that's not the case unless you just go eat a bunch of shit for like weeks on end. What does the research talk about with this? Because I know we, me and you know in the drink stuff, like all the time you get a client eating a thousand calories and you start walking them up and get them to maintenance. They're like, oh my God, I only gained like three pounds. I'm eating a thousand and, and calories we see, more. We also see in overfeeding studies that actually both resting metabolic rate and total daily energy expenditure increase in the face of overfeeding. But the next metabolism myth that we need to be debunked, we need to debunk and need to die honestly at this point. So I'm going to nail the, the I'm going to put the nail in the coffin at this point is that having a low metabolic rate automatically predisposes you to gaining weight in the future or that it's the cause of why you continue gaining weight. And Jeff, I can't tell you how many times I have a consult with a new client and they tell me that they've gained X amount of pounds in the past year. And they say that it's because they have a low resting metabolic rate. And although I'm never one to discount a client's feelings, I do think it's important to lay out the facts, especially when someone's belief system has been influenced by fallacies and myths that have been put out by uninformed influences in the fitness industry. So many assume that the no, reason they, they seem to so. gain weight easily is as a result of having a slow metabolism. And in a 2016 comparative study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, researchers looked at whether having a low BMR, aka a slow metabolism, is predictive of someone's chance of future weight gain. And this study looked at five or 757 individuals and assessed their basal metabolic rates and body compositions. They then separated the participants into the top and bottom 15 percentiles based on their BMR adjusted for their level of fat-free mass, fat mass, age, and sex. So they took all these confounders and they really divided these people up properly. There was a significant difference in BMRs between the top 15%, which was labeled as the high metabolic rate group, and they had uh, an average BMR of two over 2,000 calories per day as compared to the bottom 15% group, which was labeled as the low metabolic rate group. And they had an average BMR of 1,510 calories per day. So we're talking nearly a 500 calorie lower BMR for those in the slow metabolism group as compared to those in the high metabolism group. And they then followed these participants over the next 10 years to monitor their changes in weight over that time period. So a long period of time. 
they found that there were no significant difference in the rate of weight gain between both the top, aka the fast metabolism group, and the bottom, aka the slow metabolism group. And when they analyzed the exact rate of a weight gain per year, it was found that those with a fast metabolism gained 1.1 pounds per year and around 11 pounds over that 10-year follow-up period, as compared to those in the slow metabolism group who gained a bit less at 0.66 pounds per year or around 6.6 pounds over a decade. So if anything, those in the slow metabolism group actually gained less than we'd expect as the research for uh, the agency of health finds that the that most adults tend to gain an average rate of um, weight gain of around 1.1 to 2.2 pounds per year during adulthood, which adds up to around 11 to 22 pounds per decade. And these findings show that having a slow metabolism does not predict greater weight gain long term, especially you know, or despite the fact that the average difference in BMR from the participants in the fast group versus the bot or the slow group differed by about 500 calories per day. And ultimately, we cannot control every aspect of our metabolic rate in a really influential or impactful way, but we can control our habits around our nutrition, our training, our daily movement practice, our sleep, and our stress management. So a slow metabolism isn't responsible for whether you gain weight or not, your actions, your decisions, your lifestyle, and especially your habits, behaviors, and decisions around nutrition are. Hmm. I think that was really, really well said. Your baseline metabolic rate predicts your chance of weight regain after a diet. Uh, I want to say this another way. Are you saying that after you get done uh, dieting that what you were at before could possibly gain more body fat? Or are you saying um, a different so, way? Yeah, so really the this is a commonly stated and believed misconception is that our starting metabolic rate predicts our chance of weight regain after a diet. So this is what this myth alludes to. So if you have a low metabolic rate and you go into a diet, we know that it's going to decrease even more. So say that someone's always had, you know, a quote unquote, slow metabolism. We're just going to throw out that, that general vernacular and they go into a diet and their metabolic rate lowers because they become a lighter, smaller human being. The, the myth is that their baseline metabolic rate being slow and now having been lowered is going to predict them having a greater chance of weight regain. So really what this is, is if someone who has a low metabolic rate prior to starting a fat loss phase, the myth is that you're at a higher likelihood of gaining back all the weight you lost during a diet than someone who has a naturally high metabolic rate prior to dieting. But just like we covered the fact that research finds that someone's baseline metabolic rate doesn't predict their likelihood of successful weight loss, so those with a low metabolic rate aren't less likely to be able to lose weight, nor are they at a greater chance of gaining weight in the future as compared to those with a high metabolic rate? And research has analyzed whether someone's baseline metabolic rate predicts their actual likelihood of weight regain. So in a 2020 study, researchers looked at whether pre-weight loss baseline metabolic variables could predict someone's chance of weight regain. And to do this, they took 117 women and they measured their resting metabolic rate, their insulin sensitivity levels, and their leptin levels prior to starting a weight loss diet. Now, during the active weight loss or the active dieting phase, they lost an average of 26 pounds and then were monitored for two year for a two year follow up period uh, at the end of the weight loss diet. And in regression modeling, metabolic variables, so both the pre weight loss and the changes with weight loss, did not predict weight regain. However, Initial weight loss and time to achieve their their actual gain um, was was adjusted for co-founders. So really, what ended up happening was when analyzing the rate of weight gain at one to two years post weight loss diet, they found that none of the metabolic variables they had measured prior to the women starting the diet predicted their likelihood of weight regain. Meaning, those who had a low metabolic rate at the start of the study did not see a greater disposition or chance of weight regain after the diet. So this is another myth. If you have a you say a low metabolic rate, but just from genetic factors or just from low movement, whatever it means, low muscle mass, that doesn't mean that you're more likely if you do diet, if you do transform your lifestyle, if you do change your habits around nutrition, your training, your movement, that does not predispose you just because you had a low metabolic rate to start with to regain more weight after a diet than someone that always naturally had a fast metabolism. I, I've noticed that like technically, if you looked at me, um, I was more of a skinny kid and then I became more endomorphic while I got into bodybuilding. And I can tell you after every show, I've stayed leaner and leaner and leaner while my calories have moved up and up. And I, I don't believe in that body fat set point either. I think it's a matter of- We're going to debunk okay. that one day, my yeah. man. That is, that is a very, I will tell you, there have been many requests to cover that topic. I don't think people realize how deeply entrenched the physiology on that is. There's neural and um, you know, factors within that. There's hormonal factors. Oh, yeah. It is so deep. And I've looked into that literature for quite some time. So we are going to do a, an entire podcast on that, but it's actually yeah. not going to be on body fat set point because that's been disproven since the 50s. That's that's from Kennedy's model in the 50s. But- yeah. um. 
we're really going to look at body fat settling points and then what's called the dual intervention model, which is a better representation of body fat settling points. Because really what we see is that we have a lower intervention and an upper intervention point, meaning we, we can shift in between these, these areas, but it's not based on what people think. We have to consider both physiology, psychology, environment, behaviors. Uh, there's so many factors. It, it's so multifactorial. It's as complex of a as a topic as, as the obesity epidemic, honestly. Yeah, no, I agree. I look forward to talking about that one because people be like, aren't you worried about going back fat? And I'm like, no. So anyway, miss six increases in appetite from weight loss. Predict your likelihood of re regaining weight post diet. Ooh, I don't know. I think it comes down to how bad you want to be disciplined kind of thing, but let's get into this. All right. So on last week's episode of the show, we covered how the degree of metabolic adaptation one experiences during a weight loss diet is not predictive of their chance of regaining weight once the diet has ended, as the decreases that we see in energy expenditure that we experience when we're in a deficit are both transient and temporary. So they do not persist once we've gotten back to a state of energy balance where we're back to eating our maintenance calorie intake. And I also uh, just covered how the research does not show that someone's metabolic rate predicts their chance of weight regain after diet has ended even if there's someone with a low metabolic rate to begin with. But the metabolic adaptations we experience when we're in a deficit do not just apply to the decreases in the amount of calories we burn per day or components of our total daily energy expenditure, like our metabolic rate, our thermic effective feeding, and physical activity and energy expenditure. We also have the other diet-induced metabolic adaptations, such as decreases in our satiety hormone leptin and increases in our hunger hormone ghrelin, which cause us to experience increases in hunger and appetite once we've lost a significant amount of body fat. So that can lead many to wonder if the increases in appetite that we experience during weight loss can predict our likelihood of weight regain after finishing the diet. And this is a topic that I've been looking into for quite some time now, as we do know that if someone loses a significant amount of lean mass during a weight loss diet from not approaching their fat loss phase in an intelligent manner, where they do things like they prioritize a high protein intake, they resist and train in a progressive manner that maintains their metabolically active muscle tissue. They lose weight at a moderate rate or a moderate speed, which will ensure that they preserve muscle and that the weight that they lose predominantly comes from the loss of fat mass rather than lean mass. And they eat a nutrient dense diet, which helps to mitigate micronutrient deficiencies that they're less, they're likely to experience hyperphagia, which is an abnormally strong desire to eat an insatiable appetite that can often lead to overeating. And this is actually something we did a full podcast episode really a long time ago. I, I want to say um, at the beginning of last summer, it was on body fat overshooting. And this is really the sensation we see or the, the phenomenon we see. And now the issue with hyperphagia is that it doesn't subside or go away until someone has regained all the lean mass that they mm -hmm. lost during the diet. But the rate at which we can gain muscle is far, far slower than the rate at which we can gain fat. So this is why it's so common for individuals who crash diet to experience what's referred to as body fat overshooting, which is where you gain more fat back after a diet than you actually lost during the diet. So this is really what we see happen with individuals who have been through these yo-yo dieting cycles where they've lost 20 pounds during a diet and then they gain 25 pounds after. Now they have to lose 25 pounds again. So they crash diet another 25 pounds off and it's 30 pounds back on after they finish the diet. However, when we look at the literature on whether increases in appetite from weight loss predict an individual's likelihood of regaining weight after the diet has finished, we see different outcomes when these individuals have specifically dieted in a more intelligent, evidence-based manner. And so in a 2019 study, they had participants lose 17% of their body weight, which came out to around 44 pounds. And following the active weight loss phase, they had them refeed for four weeks at their maintenance calorie intake to stabilize their weight. And then they followed them over the next year to see their likelihood of weight regain. And throughout the study period, they measured their body weight and body composition, their subjective feelings of appetite, and their concentrations of hunger hormones via you know, uh, serum testing. And when they measured them right at the end of the weight loss phase, they found that their ghrelin levels and hunger in a fasted state had increased. So they saw higher increases in, in hunger, essentially. And then they looked at their changes in the main hunger hormone ghrelin to see if it predicted their chance of weight regain. And most would expect that those who experienced the largest increase in ghrelin would regain the most weight because they, they were experiencing the most hunger. But what they actually found was those with the larger increases in ghrelin were, were experienced by those who maintained all their weight loss or continued losing weight after the active dieting phase. So the reason that we saw greater and greater increases in ghrelin were they were still continuing to lose weight or they had successfully kept that weight loss off. So the increased ghrelin levels reflected the lower fat mass of those who achieved better weight loss maintenance. And they also found no correlation between changes in hunger, 
appetite, energy expenditure, or resting metabolic rate and weight regain at one year after the dieting phase. And other studies have found, you know, very similar outcomes where changes in appetite and hunger from weight loss do not predict our likelihood of weight regain. So in a 2011 study, they put subjects on an eight-week dieting intervention and found that ghrelin levels were higher and CCK and PYY, which are satiety hormones, gut-derived yeah. satiety hormones, were lower after weight loss. But they did not find any correlation between changes in hunger and appetite hormones and weight regain. And in a literature review, which looked at the adaptations of leptin, ghrelin, and insulin during weight loss as predictors of weight regain, they found none of the studies – um, supported the hypothesis that increases in hunger hormones during weight loss were actually associated with weight regain. So changes in leptin or ghrelin are not sufficient to predict weight regain following weight loss in free living humans, meaning people dieting in the real world. So this is a myth. Just because you experience greater levels, greater increases in appetite hormones during a fat loss phase does not mean you're more predisposed towards regaining weight in the future. So then I think it's important to get into women always have slower metabolic rates than men. Uh, no, that's not true. My friend, I trained my friend's uh, wife and she weighs like 123 pounds and eats 3,400 calories right now and can barely put a thing on. And then you have other women who don't. I think it's very much like men, dose dependent. It's just a myth that needs to die. Um, but let's break this let's down. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another myth that is really commonly cited and many believe is that women always have slower metabolisms and lower metabolic rates than men do, which is why people tend to believe that women uh, tend to struggle with weight loss more often than men do. Now, I will say from my own personal experience that I often do hear more women say that they've struggled with losing weight in the past than I hear men say, say the same. But I believe this is actually due to the fact that more women die each year than men do. And there's data that shows that around 40% of adult males attempt to diet each year to lose weight, whereas over 60% of adult females report dieting every single year to lose weight. So it makes sense that we hear more women saying that they struggle to lose weight as women are 50% more likely to go on a diet each year than men are. So just by proxy, if someone, if, if a group of individuals, if one sex is dieting more often than another, we're going to hear more of a chance of struggles, of challenges, of trying to overcome obstacles than a group that's dieting much less. However, it's important to realize that your sex alone does not independently have an effect on your resting metabolic rate or your total daily energy expenditure. And a 2021 study by Ponser and colleagues found that sex had no effect on total energy expenditure in multivariate models with fat-free mass and fat mass, nor in analyses of adjusted total energy expenditure. And by by far, the strongest predictor of someone's metabolic rate and the amount of calories they burn per day were, was their level of lean mass, whereas sex had no independent effect on these variables. So women will not automatically have a lower metabolic rate and a slower metabolism than men if they have the same amount of lean mass that a male does. Now, what we do see is that in absolute terms, women tend to have lower metabolic rates and lower energy expenditure than men, but it's only seen when we compare females and males of different body weights and body composition levels. And on average, we see that females tend to have about 10% less lean mass and 10% more fat mass than males do. So when we do comparisons between the average female and our general population who doesn't resist and train, who doesn't eat high protein, like a high protein diet to prioritize building muscle, and we compare them against the average male in our population, like the average sedentary male, the male will have a higher metabolic rate and total daily energy expenditure just as a result of being taller, being bigger, and being heavier, and having, by proxy, more lean mass. However, if we look at resistance training studies, where they have both male and female subjects do the exact same resistance training program, we see that women have just as high of a muscle building potential that males do in terms of how much of a relative increase in lean mass they gain after a training program. So if we were to compare a man and a woman who were both 150 pounds and had say 25% body fat, meaning their body composition was the same in terms of their lean mass and their fat mass, we'd see that they would have they would both have a very similar metabolic rate. And if they both were matched in terms of their resistance training program, their cardio, their physical activity, and you know their, their exact macronutrients. So we have the same amount of protein. So you have the same amount of thermic effective feeding, same amount of calories. We would see that they would burn the exact same or very similar amount of calories per day. So for all our lady listeners out there, the fact that you are a woman is not a barrier to weight loss from a metabolic or a metabolism perspective. So don't allow these types of myths to cause self-limiting beliefs around what you can achieve both from a fat loss and a muscle growth perspective. As you have the same muscle building and fat loss potential that men do, and you also have the same metabolic rates in research when they scale metabolic rates to your body composition between males and females. So this is not a limitation, and this is really a myth that needs to die. Yeah, 100%. I think we got the best myth, maybe, 
of all of them coming up that, uh, well, I don't even know how to say it, but let's just get into it. No one should diet on less than 1,200 calories a day at any point in a fat loss phase. Ooh, what do you do with a 100-pound bikini chick, man? Like, what do you do with myself? Like, I've had to make lightweight before, and, you know, I've competed. I know 2017 Junior Nationals, Jay had me damn near, I think I was 1,304 calories. You know, it just you're a muscular weird. individual. Yeah, it just is what it is. And sometimes, you know, like, that's where social media, because we saw the coaches, but like, look at this client eating 600 carbs and da 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 da. I'm like, well, cool. If I'm taking 800 milligrams of trend, I can actually do that too. And um, it just let's, kind not, of, let's not forget the complete the completeral use, the thyroid hormone use, especially yeah. the abuse of, of T3, which is just hemorrhaging people's muscle tissue. The DMP that many individuals use that will raise your metabolic rate by 10% per you know uh, dosage use. So we're, we're really discounting a lot of things when people are like, oh, my client can eat this, or I would never diet someone on, on this low this on this low amount of calories. Or if you diet your client below this amount, you're a terrible coach. Let's, let's really dig into this one because yeah. um, the last fitness industry fallacy and diet myth we need to dismantle is the idea that no one should ever have to diet on less than 1200 calories per day at any point in fat loss diet to lose weight. And over the last decade or so, there's been this myth going around that if you go too low in calories and go below this magical 1200 calorie per day threshold, that you'll stop being able to lose weight from eating too little and you're causing metabolic damage. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying you should diet on less than 1200 calories, nor am I encouraging anyone to do so. But the notion that there's this calorie cutoff point where diets stop working is flawed and incorrect on so many levels. First and foremost, what's interesting about this mythical 1200 calorie cutoff is that it's been disproven in almost every single tightly controlled metabolic word study that we have available today, which often use very low calorie diets to induce successful weight loss. For instance, we look at many of the weight loss studies done by two of the most prominent researchers in the field of obesity, Rosenbaum and Leibel, which are the two researchers who have done the most amount of controlled studies on how weight loss affects our NEAT levels. Most of their studies actually use an 800 calorie liquid diet to induce significant amounts of weight loss. And many of their studies have resulted in participants losing between 10 to 20% of their body weight. And we never see that they can't lose weight. So let's let's just clear that out and, and clear the air on that one. So if this 1200 calorie cutoff was true, we wouldn't see people eating 50% less calories than that and losing a significant amount of body fat and body weight as a result of that. So first and foremost, it's not too little, you know, based on, on the sample population. Another issue with this myth is that we need to stop with these arbitrary calorie cutoffs that are generic and don't actually fit an individual, such as the idea that you can't go below 1200 calories a day during a diet, or especially during the tail end of a diet, or that you need to reverse diet on 2000 calories per day. Cause that's another one I, I see and throw around all the time without any individualized uh, context specific to the individual that we're talking about. And this is because the calorie amount that many of us or any of us will need to continue losing fat is completely dependent on us as an individual in terms of our total daily energy expenditure, our level of muscle mass, the amount of fat that we need or want to lose, our training levels, our activity levels, and our hormones. So if you're a 120 pound female who has a sedentary job and a maintenance calorie intake of 1400 calories per day, you're most likely going to need to go below 1200 calories at some point in a diet to lose a significant amount of body weight and body fat. And also saying that you're, you're that someone um, like say you're someone who has been dieting for a significant period of time and you're eating 1300 calories a day and you're only losing a quarter pound per week. So you're really losing at a slow rate of loss. It may seem like this is a low calorie amount because you're eating 1300. So you're, you're close to that mythical 1200 calorie uh, amount. So in an absolute sense, it really seems low, but in reality, you're in an 875 calorie or 875 weekly calorie deficit, AKA a 125 calorie deficit per day, which is extremely small. So if you want to increase your rate of loss to say a half pound per week, you're going to need to get below this mythical uh, 1200 calorie cutoff to do so. So the calorie threshold you will need to eat at and the deficit you will need to induce weight loss and continue losing weight is completely dependent on you as an individual, not on a magic number that you should eat at or not go below. And the last issue with this myth is that one of the reasons why it's become so commonly stated is because we often hear individuals on social media say that they are eating 1200 calories per day and not losing weight at this calorie intake. So it, it makes it seem like this is the number that causes stalls and fat loss. But if right. we really look at how the average person in the general population diets, when they do so on their own, it's done in an inconsistent manner where they go from stages of under eating to overeating. And this is what I refer to as a weekday dieter. And what happens to most of these weekday dieters is they end up becoming weekend overeaters, meaning they underfuel and undereat 
uh, you know, Monday through Friday. And then when the weekend comes, they feel so restricted, so overly restricted and so hungry that they unintentionally overeat all weekend. So say that somebody is eating 1200 calories per day, most of the time and not losing weight. This could literally be from the fact that Monday through Friday, they are consuming 1200 calories per day. But on Saturday and Sunday, they, they decide to go out to restaurants, relax off the diet, have a few drinks and don't track their dietary intake. So say that they eat, we'll, we'll give them a modest amount. They eat 2,500 calories on Saturday and Sunday, which is easy to do with just a restaurant entree and a couple alcoholic beverages. Their actual average calorie intake across the week isn't 1,200 calories. It's closer to 1,600 calories. So if this person's maintenance intake is, say, 1,500 calories, they they undid the entire deficit they created Monday through Friday, and they're actually in a 100-calorie surplus. So if anything, mm. they see absolutely no weight or fat loss as a result of their unaccounted for eating habits and behaviors during the weekend. So ultimately, whenever you hear someone making broad-based statements, especially on social media, about calorie amounts where they say that you shouldn't eat below X amount of calories or that you have to eat above X amount of calories to reach a specific goal, yet they aren't taking into consideration any of your individual characteristics, any of your background, any of your dieting history, any of your, your lab work, or any of your biofeedback, I'd advise letting those suggestions go in one ear and out the other because they aren't intended for you and they're trying to sell you on this simple story, which makes it seem like they have the solution to all your, your worries and all your troubles, when in actuality, they're giving you a generic piece of bullshit. Dude, I... <laughs> What's up? We have time for like one extra little myth you want to throw out there that uh, maybe, I'll, you know what, what do you think about the myth of high intensity cardio superior to all their forms of cardio? Hence, like you have boot classes, boot camp classes. I've been getting a lot of people coming to me for boot camp and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to the, I, I mean, the myth of high intensity interval training, when we actually look at it in systematic reviews, we see that there are equivalent outcomes in fat loss and body composition outcomes. So there's actually a review by a researcher um, I'm blanking out his name. His first name is James. Uh, I will remember his name probably by the end of this podcast. But however, um, he has done a meta-analysis that looked at a meta-analysis and systematic review that compared both high intensity interval training versus steady state, you know, cardio and saw that there was equivalent outcomes. And so isn't it, an, you know, an advantage towards one towards the other. But what we do see in research is that there's a bigger hit on recovery capacity from HIIT training. So what we see by that, and especially with females. So actually, when we look at female physiology, they're more susceptible to perturbations in energy availability and to stresses. And so within that, we actually see from high intensity cardio or high intensity tra uh, interval training that they see higher elevations in cortisol, which could downregulate their hormone production. So really what we see with that is it could interrupt the HPO access. And so that could cause downregulations in LH, which is luteinizing hormone, which have downstream effects on estradiol production, progesterone, and then also testosterone. But also what we see within that, within that axis, is that they also, once LH is disrupted, and we see a decrease in what's called LH pulsatility, that we actually see disruptions in their thyroid production. And that's where we see that they're producing less T4 and also less T3. But what also happens within that is we see less of conversion of T4 to metabolically active T3, because most of what the, the actual uh, thyroid gland produces is T4, which is inactive. It needs to be converted. And so it needs to be converted in tissues. And then T3 exerts its metabolically active um, you know, actions on actual skeletal muscle tissue and other tissues, because th there's, a, a, there's a receptor for every in every single gland and tissue in the body for thyroid. And so really, when it comes to the myth of high intensity interval training, it isn't that it's better than the other. However, we do have to take into consideration, if you are someone that's trying to induce a greater deficit, you're really trying to aid with body fat loss, and you're trying to use really what I look at cal uh, cardio as is just a modality, a lever to pull to increase calorie expenditure, to increase energy expenditure, which is really why I'm more of a fan of steady state or even of just, you know, steps because we're getting low barrier of entry. It's super easy to do. It's low intensity. It has no recovery costs. And actually, if we look in the research on uh, modalities like walking, it actually increases recovery capacity. It stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system, which actually decreases cortisol production. So we have no none of the recovery costs that come with high intensity interval training. Also, we have to look at it from the perspective of say you're, you're smashing yourself in a boot camp class, or you're doing high intensity intervals on a cycle or on a, an elliptical or on a step mill. That's also taking energy reserves and recovery capacity from your legs, which is then going to impact 
and negatively influence your leg training subsequently. So if you're a female and you're trying to build your glutes and you're really smashing yourself three days a week on, say, you know, a lot of my females, I have them on, on glute and quad or glute and hamstring specialization cycles. So we're hitting at an increased frequency. So we are hitting, you know, lower body, say three days per week. However, if I had them also doing HIIT training two to three days per week, it's going to impede the recovery capacity because either we have to do it on the same day that they just train legs. So they're super sore. Or we have to do it in between the days that they do legs so that the next day, now they're at a, uh, essentially a recovery debt. And so really when it comes down to it, we have to realize that unless you're looking, we have to separate energy expenditure and adaptations. And so within that, if you're trying to get cardiovascular adaptations, where you're really trying to increase uh, aerobic fitness, you're really trying to increase uh, cardiovascular fitness, of course, we can utilize HIIT training as one of those modalities to do so. Um, but we can also get those very similar adaptations from long, you know, uh, steady state uh, cardio. However, we are, when we're really looking for energy expenditure, really what I'm a big fan of is doing the lowest barrier for entry, which is going to have the least cost on recovery. Because if your goal is to improve your body composition by losing body fat and building or maintaining muscle tissue, we should be looking at vectors. We should be looking to prioritize resistance training. But if you're doing anything within that, within that, you know, fat loss phase programming or training programming that's impacting your ability to progressively overload your training on a weekly basis, such as doing a ton of hit classes or doing a ton of hit cardio, that is taking away from our main goal. And it's actually putting you at a disadvantageous position to actually maintain muscle tissue and lose body fat. Because also what we see within hit training is a compensatory uh, response where people become more, um, essentially more lazy throughout the day. So there's actually like compensatory sitting. We see people slouch more, they sit more. And yeah. so they're actually decreasing their need as a result of doing that high intensity output because they're lethargic, they're fatigued, they're low on energy you know, things of that sort. So really we have to look at the entire pie instead of just, sometimes people look at intervals and they see like the metabolic burn of it. So they see, hey, in 20 minutes, I burned 300 calories, not realizing you could have done an hour walk at a leisure around the grocery store or around the park with your, your children playing in the park with them. And you could have burned that same 300 calories without all of the recovery drawbacks and all the stress that is induced by that situation. I agree hundred percent. Excuse me. I only like hit. I like hit in the off season just like five or six intervals just for basic stuff like that. Um, I'm a big fan of miss, uh, but I'm like you, once you start cranking through a diet fat loss phase, throw it first and then pull it first. Yeah. I'm a you big know, fan I, of, I, I like to front load a lot of times. If we're talking yeah. specifically contest prep, I actually like to front load our aerobic training to really get uh, increased mitochondrial biogenesis and efficiency. I really try to get people very aerobically fit at the beginning of the prep. Cause what I generally notice is that a lot of bodybuilders, a lot of competitors, they start out a fat loss phase or a contest prep. Uh, generally like the old school mentality was right from a bulk. They would go right into a fat loss phase. So you're at your highest body fat level. You're at your least I guess your least aerobically fit uh, level. And so what ends up happening is people are gas in between sets. They're really limited in their volume capacity, their recovery capacity in between sets. So I actually like to front load when they're at their highest body fat. We have the highest amount of calories on board. I like to front load the aerobic training. So longer, uh, uh, you know, I might do some intervals, but I also will do longer durations of low intensity, steady state cardio. And really what I'm trying to do is get those aerobic adaptations off the bat where they still have higher body fat, higher energy availability. And then as we get deeper into the diet, I'm more transitioning to steps and low, lower and lower intensity actions that are still going to keep their energy expenditure up. It's going to offset the down regulations and energy expenditure that we see from decreases in need, but I'm not systemically taxing the system because really when it comes to contest prep, especially, so yes, this applies to fat loss, but really when we're really getting into the nitty gritty of contest prep, which is more of a fatigue management game, when it really comes down to it, the biggest difference between a fat loss phase and a contest prep is that the levels of body fat that you're going to get down to in a contest prep are both essential and they're at a survival level that cause so many physiological adaptations that the regular lifestyle client would never encounter that there is so much more systemic fatigue on all systems. So we're talking on your endocrine system. We're talking on your metabolic system, on your hormonal system. We're talking uh, even like from a mental and dietary fatigue perspective that there really needs to be a, an extra layer of fatigue management, which is where utilizing deloads, diet breaks, uh, refeeds, stuff like that, and really being able to revitalize a contest prep competitor is really vital. And that's even where we look at Hey, listen, this guy's at four or 5% body fat. He should not be doing hit intervals when he's completely depleted, has no glycogen on stores. And also we have to think about it from a fuel substrate availability perspective. Hit is going to predominantly, it's a glycolytic activity. It burns carbohydrates, but you're, you're carbohydrate depleted because you're really low in your contest prep diet. You're going to be at a disadvantageous position to actually be able to fuel that activity. However, if we look at low intensity steady state, that is a aerobic activity, meaning it runs off of aerobic metabolism, which runs off fatty acids. So you're burning your stored body fat. And so it's more advantageous 
changes, especially as people get leaner and leaner to do less hit and more aerobic training, especially if we're trying to balance the goals. Remember, we always have to prioritize something. For every gimme, there's a gotcha. So if you really want to prioritize building muscle, you need to make resistance training your 1A and then the, the cardio, the steps, all that is your 1B. And it's only an accessory item to help you be able to increase your energy expenditure, offset some of the metabolic adaptations that decrease the amount of calories you burn per day. And also really what I try to do with cardio is I'm trying to increase the amount of calories someone's burning so that they can eat more. Ultimately, that's really my goal. It's that, hey, you know, say if we have to create a 500 calorie deficit, I want to do say 300 calories from food itself and then 200 calories from cardio rather than doing just 500 calories from food or just 500 calories from, you know, cardio. And so it's really a balance of both. Well, great, my man. Well, thanks for hitting that bonus one. Where can everybody find you at? Absolutely, guys. Feel free to always reach out to me at Brandon DeCruz underscore, which is on Instagram. And then also my email is bdecruzfitness at gmail.com. And guys, please remember to rate, like, subscribe, and also make sure that you're downloading the show. We really want to see those downloads go up. So we'd really appreciate that. But as always, guys, keep it locked on us. We will be back every single Friday from here to, you know, the, the end of time, essentially. Uh, if ladies and gentlemen, especially gentlemen, if you all give us great reviews, Brandon will post more shirtless pictures on Instagram. <laughs> um, with that being said, I can be found uh, Instagram, Jeff Unbreakable Black, YouTube, Jeff Unbreakable Black, and Relentless Forever. Uh, Jeff Unbreakable Black on YouTube is going to have my interview with, with that Stephen Pressfield did. Um, and just content I do related to my book. So with that being said, peace out. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.